Thank you for tuning in to Music Marvels with the Chickwood Beats and Breezy Gibson. I am music producer at Chickwood Beats. And entrepreneur Breezy Gibson. <laughs> <laughs> and we're glad that you're with us, rocking with us once again today. Uh, we got a show lined up for you with music industry news. Of course, beats produced by me, the Chickwood Beats. And you want to tell them the special lady that we've got joining us a little bit later? Oh, yes. Yes, 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 yes. The one and only Anne Sharia. She's going to be in the mix singer i mean just into fashion i mean into arts and so on and so forth so yeah that's gonna be it's gonna be live it's gonna be live <laughs> yeah i can't even say triple threat multi-threat yeah <laughs> yes. yep, yep. so as always we thank our home stations grander radio out of grand rapids michigan and sparks radio out of atlanta georgia and without any further ado i say we get it going oh man Crank it up. Let's get <laughs> crunk. All right, let's go. with music industry news in 2023 less than a fifth of spotify artists reached over a thousand monthly listeners so according to chart metrics year in, uh, report for 2023 it revealed that only 19.16 percent or excuse me 19.16 percent of spotify artists had over a thousand monthly listeners approximately 81 percent had fewer than a thousand listeners taylor swift in the weekend were the only artists to surpass 100 million monthly listeners for the first time that year. So, I mean, that's saying something right there. I mean, that's a huge threshold, definitely. But the fact that they just passed it in 2023, I mean, that lets you know this game is pretty uh, ruthless out here. So, Chart Metric tracks over 9.7 million Spotify artists, and around 7.9 million of these artists have fewer than a thousand monthly listeners, while just over 1.8 million had more than a thousand. Spotify's monthly listener count tallies unique individuals who streamed an artist's music at least once in the last 28 days, regardless of how many times they listen. So, I mean, you know, it's pretty particular and they're saying that it's really accurate the way that they're doing it. But yeah, those are just some stats to be aware of. So 
you know if you're not satisfied with where you're at just know that you're not the only one but you know sometimes it takes time even for um big artists to reach those thresholds that most of us probably would have thought that they reached a long time ago so the name of the game is patience wouldn't you say i concur a thousand percent <laughs> name of the game is patience all right, Sync Music has secured $250 million from their parent company, Go Digital, for acquisitions, including a major eight figure catalog purchase that's already in progress. So it's a Los Angeles based company, just in case you didn't know that, but they specialize in label services and rights management. And so, with that big influx of cash from Go Digital Media Group for music rights acquisition, they've got big plans. The investment uh, brings Go Digital's total investment in sync to $410 million, with previous injections of $100 million in 2022, $40 million in 2019, and $20 million in 2017. So right now, Sync boasts a catalog of over 80,000 assets, generate billions of monthly video and audio streams. And the company aims to allocate the new funds towards developing four rapidly expanding music genres, which are reggaeton, um, music Mexicana, Afrobeats, and country, leveraging its existing portfolio with that's already worth over $300 million. So, you know, just kind of some interesting uh, information, seeing where they're kind of betting things are going to be blowing up. Uh, we've mentioned this multiple times before about certain areas, but it's always good to know exactly what genres um, these big companies are looking into. So there you have it. Reggaeton, Music of Mexicana, Afrobeats, and Country. Yeah, well, of those, you know, with my personal opinion, Country doesn't surprise me. Mm -hmm. But the Reggaeton, Music of, music of Mexicana, and Afrobeats, now that's on the uptake right there. Yeah absolutely <laughs> and i mean you know if you think about a lot of the music that you're hearing in most of these commercials they usually fit within those genres lately how about that yeah and i noticed like a lot of modern country music has you know kind of a r&b undertones now it's kind of interesting how everyone's kind of borrowing from each other so yeah interesting landscape and we'll see what comes of that absolutely positively <laughs> All right, the Believe CEO proposes to acquire the music label in a $1.58 billion transaction. So Believe SA's founder and CEO is Dennis, I believe it's Letta Gallery. I apologize if I'm mispronouncing it, but him along with some investment firms proposed privatizing the company following a 36% share dip uh, after its 2021 IPO. And so that values the label at $1.58 billion. And so with the CEO, uh, TCV, which is the company's largest shareholder, and the private equity firm EQT, they're offering uh, 15 euros per share, which will represent a 21% premium over the closing price on February 9th. And so with the agreements to purchase 72% uh, of shares and additional offers, the consortium plans to file a tender offer for the remaining shares in the second quarter of this year, hoping to get 90% ownership, which would be enough to be able to delist the company. So, you know, with them saying, hey, these shares aren't performing the way that we think they should, let's just take it private. It'll be kind of interesting to see if that actually plays out. Um, we'll definitely keep you posted with that information, but... I feel like we've got a lot of these stories lately where these uh, public companies are kind of going backwards. Well, not backwards, but just deciding that they'd rather be private. Of course, you know, the big one that we've been talking about often was uh, BMI going private and now Believe is you know, possibly going to do the same thing, likely depending on how things play out and regulations and all that. So, yeah, just some some interesting news, wouldn't you say? Yeah, yeah. A lot of times, you know, in life and in business, you know, when somebody makes a move, um, many times the others they say, "Hey, hey, what are they doing? Hey, what are they doing? Uh, why? Let's let's check it out. Maybe that's something that, that'll be a bit a fit for us." You know. So <laughs> you, <laughs> you never know, you know. Uh, so, but anyway, you know, we'll we'll watch this and see if any others uh, buy into that. Yeah, absolutely. 
All right, Sony Music Publishing has launched a new office in Dubai. Uh, they're establishing the office there, kind of marking its expansion into the Middle East and North Africa, or MENA region for short. So the move actually coincides with uh, Universal's announcement of a partnership with DGMC to open Capital Studios in the UAE. And they're trying to you know, create a music city hub for regional and global artists and songwriters. So Warner Music, Reservoir Media, and BMI have also increased their investments in the MENA region, while Billboard even launched Billboard Arabia in collaboration with SRMG, trying to feature new charts to monitor the MENA music scene. So again, you know, that's one of those things that's kind of showing you, I feel like we have these stories, if not every week, at least every other week, about another big company uh, kind of investing there. So. I mean, the trends are showing you like where things are heading. There's been a lot of growth in the region. So, you know, if you're an artist kind of looking to expand a little bit, maybe reach out to one of these artists in the region and, um, you know, that kind of gels with what you're already doing and uh, see if you can get some collaboration going. Yeah, well, co speaking of collaboration, one of my former um, girlfriends <laughs> I ran into on, 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 on Saturday, this past Saturday, told me that in uh three or four more days she's going to be going to dubai mm. and uh, i'm like oh really <laughs> so maybe i'll catch up with her and, and uh whisper in her ear a little bit about hey let's see what you can do for us and so on and so forth while you're over there make some connections for us yeah that'd be great <laughs> yeah 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 plant plant the uh music marvels flag over there on the land you know if you can without getting in trouble yeah, absolutely yeah, yeah. we love that <laughs> all right groover has secured eight million dollars in funding for its music promotion platform it's a french startup that was established in 2019 and it aids in independent artists promoting their music to industry influencers so they've had 350,000 artists onboarded since its inception and the company's secured eight million in series a funding to kind of propel that growth a little bit. The CEO, Romain uh, Palmieri, emphasizes that their mission is to offer comprehensive support to artists and expand internationally. Additionally, Groover is introducing the Groover Club for coaching and master classes for a thousand artists in France and the U.S. alongside Groover Obsessions, which provides additional career opportunities for select artists and already they've got 300 that are benefiting from that particular program so they've already got stuff in the works and they're just going to expand on it but yeah special heads up to artists in the U.S. and France if that sounds like something you're interested in maybe dig into it for a little more info and see if it'll be a good fit yeah yeah by all means yeah do that. yep <laughs> All right, YouTube Shorts has introduced music video remixing, and this is right in the midst of uh, Universal Music Group's absence on TikTok. So, I mean, it seems like it might be on purpose, but <laughs> yeah, they recently introduced a feature that allows users to incorporate music videos into their own short form videos. And, um, you know, like I said, it seems like it's aimed at competing with TikTok right now. The timing is really, really convenient and it leverages their extensive library of official music videos which will distinguish it from TikTok, especially after universal took its catalog uh, off the platform so youtube shorts has seen significant growth with daily views reaching 70 billion but it still trails behind reels and despite this growth TikTok is still the dominant short form video platform but hey that's a really interesting move we kind of got to give credit where it's due um, they saw an opportunity and seized it. So I'd be really curious to see how this affects their numbers going forward in the future, wouldn't you? Yeah, yeah. I mean, video's the way, video's here. I mean, everybody's in the videos. So, and there's a lot of creativity out there. So yeah, we gotta watch that, see which, which direction this goes. In. Yeah, and this next story kind of, uh, you know, fits right after that, but the digital agency Round Group um, has identified music opportunities for Reels, 1.8 billion active uh, users. So Round released the report examining Meta's music potential, drawing insights from over 200 campaigns and analyzing 30,000 Reels posts. 
And so it indicates that Reels gained 400 million monthly active users last year in 2023, reaching a total of 1.8 billion. And additionally, it highlights that 48% of Instagram users earn on TikTok. So it already makes Reels an appealing platform regardless of what's happening with TikTok's music right now. So the study also reveals that Reels views grow through the week and kind of peak on weekends while TikTok usage hits its high point on Fridays. So despite this, TikTok, you know, again, still in the lead in daily usage. But um, yeah, with users spending 54 minutes a day compared to Reels, 33 minutes. So people spend more time on TikTok versus Reels, but still some great information to know so that way you know how to handle your marketing and your Reels and uh, TikToks or whatever you're doing to kind of promote your music. But yeah, those are some very, very valuable statistics to know. And it can kind of help you figure out where you want to budget or market your time. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I just uh, an example. I mean, the my figures uh, pale compared to the figures you're talking about. But on Facebook, I actually created a real uh, a short one um, about a month ago um, using some sound from um, one of the older Biggie Small songs. And uh, but it was a, a, a positive uptick concerning uh, more in store in uh, 2024. And so uh, um, it's amazing. I looked at that on my, I was scrolling on my phone this past weekend and uh, boom, you know, it had 991 views. Mm. And, you know, it kind of caught my eye. So when I went back and looked yesterday, it's over a, a grand, over a thousand, which, you know, I never thought that it would get that high anyway. Okay, mm -hmm. and so, but that that's fueling the fire for me to do that with other, um, um, you know, catchy music phrases, and so you know, you've got on the one hand, uh, um, UMG, you know, uh, removing, you know, and and, and <laughs> but hey, others, the YouTube Shorts are adding, so yeah, let's let's watch this real closely and see where it leads. Yeah. Absolutely. Because, you know, people are still kind of wondering how the whole TikTok and UMG thing is going to pan out just because, you know, you see those stats uh, with how many people are actually using TikTok and, you know, how long they use it. Are those people going to gravitate to these other um, platforms or are they just going to, you know, peek around UMG and see what else they can get, you know, whether it's the other two major labels or more independent artists. But yeah, that's you said it all we can do is really wait and see but you know, we'll definitely keep you posted with any information we get and thanks for sharing those stats um, with what you experienced yeah well and and then just yesterday i made a a shorty uh a short video um and uh <laughs> actually with the topic of some aliens and stuff like that all right so uh with sound effects and blah 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 all right so uh i used the short uh, music backtrack and uh but when i put it i put a lot of work into it so mm -hmm. when i uploaded it to tiktok guess what mm -hmm. <laughs> i was so upset i was so upset okay oh no wouldn't go for them but guess what it did roll with um instagram yeah and i was like whoa okay okay but yeah i mean i was i was quite steamed when that happened so. yeah you know, I think a lot of creators are kind of going through that right now. So, yeah, honestly, yeah, if you ask my personal opinion, like I really couldn't tell you which way it's going to go or who's going to cave first. So, yeah, I don't know. We'll have to see. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Sony's revenue from recorded music and publishing reaches $2.52 billion in the fourth quarter of 2023 which marked a 14% year-over-year increase. So Music Business Worldwide estimates that Sony's global music rights operations encompassing recorded music and music publishing earned that figure for that calendar, which was, uh, excuse me, yeah, a 14% increase from the same period in 2022. So in terms of revenue, Sony's combined music rights operation generated around $309 million more in the fourth quarter last year compared to the previous year's quarter. So, hey, growth is always good. We got to see like when they actually release those uh, official stats. But 
those figures came out of uh, Sony Corporation's actual report. And yeah, music business worldwide, they love numbers. They can do all the crunching and figure the stuff out to report on it before most other people do. So yeah, just a little heads up of what was happening with Sony in the last quarter. That's a good heads up right there. Mm-hmm. All right, and you know, of course that growth uh, comes for a reason. They have to be diligent about getting their money. And so this next story is about them filing a lawsuit for unpaid sync fees from Whitney, from the Whitney Houston biopic. So they filed a suit against the creators of the biopic that came out in 2022, I Want to Dance with Somebody, saying that um, they didn't receive payment of fees for syncing her music recordings to the film. So the unauthorized use of so- the Sony controlled tracks has caused significant harm to Sony Music and Whitney Houston's estate while benefiting the defendants. So the la- lawsuit targets uh, Anthem Films and other companies that were involved in the production. Despite the film's substantial earnings, which theatrically grossed over $59 million, Sony hasn't gotten paid. So now they're seeking compensation for that infringement and damages from Anthem and the others involved in the production. But, you know, I heard that they gave kind of a response like, oh, well, we were waiting on our uh, tax credit from the state. And then once we received that, we were going to pay Sony. But hey, it doesn't work like that because we all know biopics don't work without the music. So, you know, to be kind of raking that in and that's not even talking about what it earned after uh, being in the theaters, but just 59 million already there and Sony hasn't been paid. So we already know, you know, they're definitely going to have to cough up something. Um, We'll have to see if it's going to be more than what they actually owe just because of how things kind of played out. But yeah, just a little FYI and a good reminder. Um, you know, if you owe somebody money, they don't care about who you were planning to use to pay them. They just want the money. And yeah, we'll just have to see how this turns out. But I'm willing to bet that it's definitely going to be in Sony's favor. What do you think? Yeah, I, I agree. I concur. Yeah, that's, that's wild, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, wow. That's yeah. It. They got, hey, they got legal teams. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All yeah. these companies have legal teams and they got magnifying glasses out. So when something questionable comes in and they put it on a magnifying glass, there you go. Yeah. I was trying to understand, like, why would you even risk that? Especially with a company as large as Sony. Yeah. Um, <laughs> you know they're going to come for the money. But. Yeah. And, and there could be penalties associated with the money on top of that. Right. Yeah, Yeah. this is definitely going to be more than whatever they had to pay, uh, whatever they initially agreed upon. So, yeah, I I hope they think it was worth it. Um, (laughs) That was a strange gamble to make. Yeah, it was. All right, Duetti has secured $90 million uh, to invest and transform music financing services. So it's a music financing platform, and it's closed that funding round that advanced its Uh, mission to acquire catalog tracks at scale kind of reinforcing the positive outlook for the independent music market so the platform lets artists generate immediate cash flow by selling master catalogs or individual tracks which was previously only available to you know a-list artists but now it's becoming open to a broader range of talent so this new funding is going to support that growth um, technology development and marketing capabilities Duetti has expanded its team with offices in New York, L.A., Miami, and it's become trusted uh, for what over 250 artists. That's a lot. So the company offers financial options ranging from 10,000 to 2 million, reflecting the substantial growth of independent artists in recent years. So the fact that 250 independent artists can take advantage of this is definitely a positive outlook. You know, if you think that maybe you'd qualify to be one of those, make sure you check into it. But, you know, that is kind of um, exciting to know that you know, one, they are seeing the growth in it and know that they can help more artists and other people are actually investing in them because they believe that as well. So definitely good news for the independent market, wouldn't you say? Yeah, yeah. I mean, anything for the independent market that can be a, a plus is a good thing, you know, so especially something like this. Mm-hmm. 
All right. An appeals court has reversed the $1 billion copyright verdict against Cox Communications by the major labels. Um, So the federal appeals court in Virginia has overturned parts of the 2019 verdict uh, that said that they were basically um, responsible for the copyright infringement of over 10,000 musical works by its subscribers. So the court has actually ordered a new trial stating that the billion dollar penalty was unjustified because even though it agreed with what the jury found saying that they contributed to the infringement, the court reversed the verdict just because it wasn't um, intentional. So the vicarious liability, they're saying that that wasn't really a fair amount. And that's because Cox didn't actually profit from the subscriber infringement directly. So music companies argued that Cox knowingly contributed to the copyright infringement by its subscribers and failed to respond effectively to the notices. So, yeah, we got to see how this new trial is going to play out. Um, You know, I guess the explanation for why they reversed that does kind of make sense. But I guess to still let it go on, because, you know, they probably know that that's part of the reasons why the subscribers were using them. So that way they could continue to infringe uh, upon those copyrights but yeah we just got to see how this plays out um yeah i doubt that they're still going to get away scot-free but maybe it'll just be a little less than a billion dollars what do you think (laughs) (laughs) a little less than a billion a little less than a billion i doubt much less but hey (laughs) (laughs) whoa well um you know the fact that they ordered a new trial i mean that shows somewhere near there some inconsistencies enough to make them to enough mm-hmm. for them to uh, make that notable. Mm-hmm. So, um, hey, it's in the courts. So we'll yeah, see. yep, and we'll definitely keep you posted as we get more info. Either a yay or a nay. Mm-hmm. <laughs> There's a lot of lot of work um, attached to all of this. I mean, wow. Yeah. All right, Universal Music Group has invested $240 million in Chord Music Partners. So UMG is acquiring a minority stake. Uh, The platform was founded by investment firm KKR and Dundee Partners. So the current deal values Chord at $1.85 billion with UMG purchasing a 25.8 interest. KKR is going to sell its majority stake to Dundee Partners, which will leave them with 74.2% alongside Universal. So the agreement includes a long-term strategic partnership between UMG and Dundee Partners to manage CORE's rights um, and acquire additional catalogs. Universal will administer publishing rights and distribute recordings for CORE's existing portfolio of over 60,000 music copyrights featuring artists like Jimmy Jam and Terry Lewis, ZZ Top, The Weeknd, Lord, Kid Cudi, John Legend, and the list just goes on and on. So now, basically, with this deal, as Music Business Worldwide puts it, Universal Music Group is able to buy more stuff without spending too much of their own money. So, yeah, obviously, this was a good call, and it'll be kind of interesting to see how this affects their bottom line uh, this year, actually. So, smart move. Good plan. What do you think? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, um, rather than just sit pat and go with the flow, you know, they're being very uh, strategic and, uh, hey, making some moves. (laughs) Here's another one that we got to keep our eye on. Yeah. So, um, you know, they got sixty thousand music copyrights. That you know, that's that's no small change at all. Yeah, right. especially from those artists. Yeah. And that's just a few. I mean. Yeah. Yeah. So, hey, here we go. Sit yeah. back, put our feet up, eat some popcorn, watch and see what happens. Yep, for sure. All right, we're gonna take a quick pause for the cause, and then we'll be back with our special guest right okay. after this. Oh, 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 
Hey family, this is Breezy Gibson, social media influencer. If you're an aspiring artist, or if you're a seasoned professional music artist, and you have a music video that you want to share with a global television audience, your search is over. Whether it's jazz, rock, hip hop, Latino, gospel, pop music, country, house, techno, reggae, Hispanic, and other genres, this is the right spot. Whether you're located in the United States, Europe, Africa, South America, India, Mexico, Asia, Australia, Italy, or other countries, we got you covered. Contact me at GetSparksNow at gmail.com. That's G-E-T-S-P-A-R-K-X-N-O-W at gmail.com. Or leave me a message at 678-632-2620. Let's get it together. Hey, this is a chick with beats. I am a multi-genre music producer and strategist to indie artists and labels. Visit my website, achickwithbeats.com, for resources for artists and instrumentals available in various genres for songs, vlogs, blogs, podcasts, themes, TV, film, commercials, and more. Once again, that's achickwithbeats.com, A-C-H-I-C-K-W-I-T-B-E-A-T-Z. Let's make something happen. Welcome to this segment of um, Music Marvels with a Chick with Beats and Breezy Gibson. It's a very, very special segment. And today, without any further hesitation, bringing to our group today is a young lady who's uh, blazing a trail in her own right. Uh, she's multi-talented. Uh, she's very focused. Uh, she's on board and uh, got some big plans that she's right in the middle of. So without any further ado, bringing to you the one and only and Sharia and Sharia. Are you there? Hey, Uh oh, <laughs> Uh oh. okay. So you're, you're just, you're just busting the door in today. And that's a good thing. That's a good thing. Okay. So uh, share a bit about yourself as far as um, who you are, where did you come from? Um, what are you representing on earth today and things like that. So our listeners can get familiar with you. The ones that haven't met you just yet. Oh, so I am from Denver, Colorado. I live in Dallas, Texas right now. Um, I have been an artist for, oh my gosh, I don't even know how long. I think I was probably born an artist, um, but singing professionally for a, about 18 years now. Um, I'm also uh, very heavy in in the performing arts um, when it comes to being a thespian. I love the Shakespeare festivals. Give me some some Lady Macbeth, and we are just oh, best friends. Um, so I I love musical theater. Uh, right now, I am continuing the project Unveiled. Uh, which is available now for your listening pleasure on all um, digital outlets if you'd like to take a listen to that. Um, so, yeah, that's a little bit about me. Okay. All right. So now um, you're you're juggling a whole lot of different talents, being such as you're uh, not only a singer, but you're a model, actor, poet, writer, director. Man, I mean, so you're really stirring it up, uh, keeping yourself busy, and uh, never a dull moment, huh? Yeah, yeah. It's um, it's a hard task to stay focused on one thing. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay. But I have been blessed to to be able to do a plethora of things. Um, so I am grateful for that. Good deal. A chick with beats. You got some thoughts? And I mean, that's pretty amazing with all the stuff that you named. Um, you know the the creativity just kind of flew was flowing from uh, everything that you described there so yeah tell us a little bit about um i guess with all the different things that you're doing what do you find yourself gravitating more towards uh currently i guess uh so my main focus right now um my main two focuses right now um is my music project um and also my book, which will be coming out in the summer. Um, that is called Little Black Dress. So I'm super excited about that. 
Um, I can't wait for the press release for that. It's it's, it's a really um, interesting book. Um, so I hope you guys will keep your ears and eyes peeled so that you can grab it and love it. Um, and the music project. Um, and this was interesting that we chose today to, um, you know, chat because yesterday marked um, one year since my best friend, brother, and producer actually passed away, so this is a, it's a it's a it's a good and a sad moment. But I am so happy that I'm able to talk about the project that we did because that allows me to remember that he is not forgotten and that our music is heard. Mm. 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 Very deep, very deep, and very meaningful, indeed. Indeed, the fact that you're able to to carry that torch on, that alone, um, is a very very significant um, piece of information right there. So, uh, you know, we lift you up for doing that, and um, just are, are just very um, surprised, but then at the same time, uh, very very um, respectful that you're doing that as well. Um, so Thank now, you. okay, share a little bit, if you could, into um, the aspect of being a poet. What's that like? Oh, my gosh. So you get to just be free. Um, so I, I think I may have heard someone say, like, uh, the most, the most expressive you can be with words turns into music. And, and it turns into such a melody that you can't get it out of your head. And I think that that is really what poetry is because when you can express yourself in a way that it's uh, astounding and people are like, oh my gosh, <laughs> and it sticks with them. I love poetry. Like it, it helps me, it's therapeutic for me. Um, it doesn't have to rhyme all the time. You know, you have sonnets, you have, um, your traditional poetry. It, it's Poetry is just great. And I probably sound like a dork, but I love it. <laughs> well, if you are, I am too, because I, I love poetry as well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, matter of fact, when I first started performing, I wouldn't even actually call myself a rapper because it was basically just poetry I had written, um, performed to some of my music. And so what would you... I guess advise any poet out there that might be listening um, if they're feeling kind of apprehensive about uh, sharing their work or you know even just recognizing how much flexibility exists in poetry like what advice would you have for them to kind of plug through and you know be able to express themselves and use it as therapy as you have yeah I think one for me I had to learn that my poetry was first for me and and then once I was able to accept the poetry for what it was and how it spoke to me, then I was able to share it with others. And once you share it, it is so beautiful and not everybody is going to understand it. And that's OK. Um, if they don't understand it, it's totally fine. Um, I'm sorry if I cut out there. I was getting a call for some reason. Um, but... <laughs> If they don't understand it, that is fine. Um, but the prayer is that you're able to identify exactly who you are through your poetry. Mm -hmm. So, like, it, I've I've noticed that I have like an Edgar Allan Poe type of um, feel when I write, um, <laughs> and I didn't notice it until very recently that I had that type of. Um, that kind of word structure. Um, and I notice I do that even in my lyrics for my music because I wrote my whole album. But for any poet, I would say just make sure that you are true to yourself and editing is always subjective. Mm. <laughs> so if I say there should be a comma here, it doesn't necessarily mean you wanted to put a comma there. Or if we want to change the grammar here, it doesn't necessarily mean that that is how you wanted it to come out because mm. it's poetry it's art it's very um it can be very eclectic so just be you it's 
Jews okay, right there. now, <laughs> um, let me say, suggest, or uh, give some this input right here. Now, the type of person that you're coming across as that we're receiving, that I'm receiving, is a, a take charge person. The type of person that if I was in a room and um, if you were the speaker in that room, uh, whether you're on stage or whatever, is that um, all ears and all eyes uh, would be paying attention to every word you're saying because um, you're not one to um, just lollygag. You're getting straight to the point, and that's a great thing. And so have other people given you um, accolades like that as well? <laughs> I really appreciate that. Um, <laughs> no. They haven't. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. Yes. Okay. I well, definitely had to grow into that. And that had that has come and is I'm still growing with that because you have to have a level of confidence within yourself in order to take charge of any situation, in order to be in complete and total control of yourself. I got a Phoenix. Um, well, it's kind of like a Phoenix slash eagle depending on who you ask on my tattoo on my neck but <laughs> the tattoo meant to me supreme authority and so supreme authority over myself and not allowing anyone else other than god to control what i do mm. well said well said now um um i know a chick with beast has got a question waiting but let me let me throw this in there now Around here, um, the hashtag um, women in music is very, very significant. Um, you know, and we kind of go out of our way to roll the red carpet out on uh, to women in music or in in the uh, the arts because of you know various connotations about um, some males not really opening the door or or you know feeling like. Um, you know, th they have a certain superiority, and you know, but but the way you're coming across, uh, my friend, you're not you're not hesitating at all to bust through the door, and I and that's coming across very very good because you've got a, a strong place in what it is that you're doing, and I mean, there's no need to um, shutter in the corner. Might as well walk on, bust on through the door, and um, you know, keep. Uh, your your um, plan to accomplish what you're trying to accomplish, right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I and I think that that every person um, needs to possess that because I think sometimes we allow others to hold our destiny in their hands, and it's it's not up to anyone but us. We got to put the work in, you know. Um, nobody should outwork me on getting me to where I would like to go. Mm. Mm -hmm. Well said. Absolutely. Um, yeah, when you had said that, you know, maybe you haven't really heard it as much as you should, you know, it's one thing that I've kind of noticed a lot lately with a lot of people kind of feeling that way, but, you know, a lot of times you get what I like to call closet supporters. <laughs> like they see you, they they recognize what you're doing, but sometimes they just don't really know how to say it or, you know, for whatever reason. But yeah, I love the fact that you still have the confidence anyway, because yeah, for every good thing that you hear, it's probably, you know, at least 10 more people that feel the same way, but just won't tell you. But um, yeah, that's, that's really phenomenal. Um, the confidence that you exude and everything. Um, I do have a question really quick, though, about your singing. Um, yeah. Was that something that you've kind of always known or you just kind of, you know, had to work at it or how did that come about? Okay, so th that's a, a two-part answer, probably. <laughs> um, <laughs> so I'm a preacher's daughter, okay? Mm. Uh, my dad is a bishop. My mother is a preacher. And so we grew up in church. And, of course, in the preacher's kids, they got to sing in the choir, right? Mm -hmm. So um, I started singing when I was, like, five or six in the choir. Wow. But it wasn't it wasn't my first love. It really wasn't. I wanted to be on stage and I wanted to be an actor. Mm. That's that's what it was. I wanted to be an actor. So then I found musical theater 
And so when I found musical theater, it was like, oh my gosh, I get two things in one. <laughs> and that's when I really, really fell in love with music when I was able to couple it with acting. And so since I'm not always doing musical theater, when I'm stepping on stage, I step into the character of that song. So that gives mm -hmm. me my musical theater. Wow. D did that answer your question? It did. Okay. Wow. Good. <laughs> <laughs> That's really amazing. Okay. Okay. And so now as we slide on throughout, um, uh, through your, uh, your realm, your, uh, uh, your umbrella of, of talents, uh, share with our audience a little bit about um, the fact that you've um, stuck both of your feet into becoming a director. So now what's that about? Oh, Lord Jesus. That is probably <laughs> one of the hardest things you can do is direct. Because it it's just like editing. It's subjective, right? Mm -hmm. So the first time I directed anything was a stage play because... Um, I, I have not had the opportunity yet to direct film, but I will get there. Um, so when directing stage production, the productions are huge and you're responsible for every little thing that happens on the stage. And because things are over exaggerated um, with the uh, projection, with costuming, with from the, the back of the house to the front of the house and all in between, that is such a task. And understanding the roles of each character, what we want to display, what we want the people to understand, and we want the people to be in love mm -hmm. with this play, this stage production. So when I got into that, it happened to, um, <laughs> it happened initially, um, at a church that I was going to that did these huge stage productions that would have 40 and 50,000 people uh, coming to see the shows. Wow. So that's, yeah. that's a huge responsibility. Yeah. <laughs> and just learning the script and making sure that you're respectful to each person in the staff and on the cast, you have to make sure that they're understanding that yes, I'm being direct because I need, I want you to be the best character in this position that we cast you for, as well as your best self, while following the direction so that we can make it believable mm -hmm. to where you're not getting caught acting. Because that is the worst thing you can do, <laughs> is to be caught acting. <laughs> mm -hmm. Like, I just want to feel like these, these are people that are, are living on stage in front of me not acting like people living on stage in front of me. Wow. Yeah, that's really important because I think a lot of times, you know, people are so, I guess, involved in whatever's taking place. They don't realize what happened behind the scenes in order to get the production to the level that they're seeing it. Because, I mean, honestly, a director can make or break, <laughs> you know, whatever they're working on. And I don't think enough people actually acknowledge or recognize um, how important that position is yeah it's whew, it's a lot <laughs> it's a lot especially that volume of uh the audience size my goodness yeah <laughs> yeah it, it's very it can be intimidating but it's also you know it's, it's a blessing too because that amount of people have seen your work and what you do and hopefully they appreciate it and will come back Awesome. Well, okay, so now, what are some of the sizes of the the casts? Uh, would it run from um, two or three people up to um, ten or fifteen or um, thirty or so? Um, tell us a little bit about that. So, if we're talking about that particular venue, um, we never had a cast less than thirty people. Um, on stage at one point or another because we have our supportive cast, our, you know, our some ensemble cast, we have our principal roles, and then not even to mention um, everyone that's um, the techs and our symphony and all of those people. We're just talking about people who are on stage at some point. 
Mm. Not our backstage people, not not the people, not our stage managers who are keeping people on deck and ready to go. And, you know, people who are manning the green room and making sure that our actors have snacks or our sound people. We're not even talking about any of that. We're talking about actors that will grace the stage at one point or another. So. Okay, so with this being February, let's say um, a production is slated to um, have its opening night in um let's say uh august okay so about when would your practice start on it? so for me because i do have a production that is going to be coming out um next february we're going to be starting our rehearsals um we're, we'll start our casting call in uh late august finish those in september rehearsals start in october um, and then we'll continue on. Of course, we're, we know we're going to have a little bit of a gap because of Thanksgiving and Christmas. And then we'll resume and heavy uh, promotions will start in December and January for a February opening. A chick with beats, I'm telling you. <laughs> and Shira sounds like she's the one on the move. She's oh, she's yeah. not messing around. She's uh, she's handling things, wouldn't you say? Absolutely. That's phenomenal. And especially to be able to thrive and, you know, all the different creative outlets that you do is just, it's really, um, yeah, commendable. So, yeah, it's phenomenal. And kudos to you for that. Yeah, I need to talk to y'all every day. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. So now, now we hadn't even touched on the aspect of you being a model. Okay. Share with our listeners a little bit about that. Okay, so <laughs> when I started modeling, I needed braces. Um, <laughs> so <laughs> when I started modeling, my mom was like, oh, you're so pretty. And I think it was her trying to like build my confidence because I really needed braces really badly. Um, and so we did, uh, we started doing pageants and then I won most photogenic. And then so she put me in these classes so I think I was maybe 11 or 12 when I started this venture in modeling. Oh, wow. And then it just continued to grow. But then, because I am not a quote-unquote, at that time, a quote-unquote runway model because I'm curvy. And, um, you know, usually you have to be like a size 2 or less. And if you're a size 10, you're considered plus size. But now, that's a thing of the past because now, you know, big is in. So I was considered commercial print model um, for quite a while. And, and then when I became an older adult, I'm not that old, but when I became <laughs> an adult, <laughs> when I became an adult, um, I was able to do runway and it is so rewarding. Like, again, you get to step into this character because you know you get the makeup and you get the hair and you get all these couture outfits and things that people will probably not buy normally but you know it's it's very artistic so you get to be a part of these shows it's awesome it's amazing wow that's really cool <laughs> <laughs> okay so now as we round it out with your singing okay here we go so now what's going on with your singing that you want our listeners to know about that Anshuria is involved with right now. Man. Okay. So I'm getting ready to do South by Southwest. If you don't know what that is, that is, um, which I did it last year as well. So I am doing South by Southwest, which is a festival for independent artists that happens in Austin, Texas every year. So I am going to be doing that on March the 16th and 17th. Um, so I'm super excited about that. And in addition, of course, I already have my album, which is available, um, that I put out, um, in memory of my brother, friend, producer, Unray Milligan. Um, we put that out. So it is what it is. It's an as is record, but it's a wonderful record. It is called Unveiled and it is available on all music outlets. So we are really pushing that. I actually just did a video for one of the singles called Ain't Got Time. So that is available and streaming. Um, if you go to my Facebook, you can see it. My Instagram, you can see it. 
or my little YouTube page that I just started. Don't judge me because I just started one. <laughs> um, <laughs> but it's called Ain't Got Time. Um, and it, that's probably one of my favorite because that's a very poetic song in the lyrics. And, um, and it's jazzy. So I think you guys will love that song. So we are pushing that while I'm working on another project. Um, so that is what is happening right now, which I'm about to go into rehearsal for. Okay. And um, now where do you want people to follow you or go to on online so that they can keep up with you and or purchase anything that you have uh, that's out there uh, ready to, to buy? Okay. So got your pen and paper. Here we go. <laughs> so you can go to onsharia.com. That is my website. Um, you'll find information there. You can follow me on Facebook. Um, and that's at on Sharia. My musician page is the real on Sharia. Um, you can follow me on Instagram and that is at on Sharia. And you can shoot me an email at booking at on Sharia.com. If you'd like for me to come to your town. <laughs> <laughs> well, I say what Bisa sounds like she's got the whole thing uh, wrapped up um, in a professional manner. Do you think? Absolutely, absolutely. And um, I just throw a, this out there. You know, it's up to you. But since you're doing South by Southwest next month, you said the 16th and 17th. I think you yeah. should come back and tell us all about it. Oh, and I will. <laughs> All right. So, yeah, let's get you back on and you can uh, share your experiences there with us and our audience. Whoop, whoop. I'm excited. Awesome. <laughs> yeah, well, well, let's make it happen. And uh, hey, that clock is ticking. And for many reasons, we're going to bring this to a close. Um, and then we know you got to jump out of here and go right into a rehearsal. So thank you so much for taking the time to be with us and sharing with our listeners. And you've got a lot going on. We're looking forward to you coming back to sharing even more uh, in the not too distant future. All right. Yay. Thank you, guys. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, look, Ansharia, ladies and gentlemen, Ansharia.com. That's A-N-S-H-E-R-E-A.com. Check her out and uh, don't be shy about checking it out. Take take care. Thanks for um, checking in with us and be blessed, okay? Thank you, too. Have a good night. Same. All right. And that does it for this week's edition of Music Marvels with the Chickwood Beats and Breezy Gibson. Once again, we thank you for joining us. We thank our home stations, Grander Radio out of Grand Rapids, Michigan, and Sparks Radio out of Atlanta, Georgia. And I'm already looking forward to next week. Um, yeah, we got a real treat for you with our next guest <laughs> coming up then, too. So definitely make sure that you tune back in again. And this is just a great time, right? Yeah, yeah, coming up on the end of February. I mean, you know, so now you know, uh, even though it might be cold in some spots right now in the U.S., you know, I don't know about abroad. Well, it probably is over there too. Um, but uh, for us in the Northern Hemisphere, getting ready for springtime, getting ready for summertime, yes. getting ready for outdoor concerts, getting ready for being hearing music in the parks, getting ready. Yes. Hey, it's going to be a lot of, uh, of, of, of artists, indie artists everywhere. So, yeah. Coming out of the coming out of the buildings, because, you know, to absorb the sunshine. So, hey, yeah. good time of the year. Good time of the year. Man, you painted such a pretty picture. I'm so excited. <laughs> <laughs> but now, but now, on the, for those in the southern hemisphere, uh, it's going to be the exact opposite. Mm. Mm, we're sorry. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, yeah, until next time, you know where to find us. Tune in, tell a friend. We'll see you then. Peace. Peace. <laughs>